it's Ivy Slater, and you're listening to Her Success Story Podcast, a show where gutsy businesswomen share their success journey. Hi, it's Ivy Slater, and welcome to today's episode of Her Success Story, where I'm having the pleasure to interview leaders who have led through unexpected times. Our series is called How to Be a Visionary Leader in Unexpected Times. And these are leaders who, I, how I say it is, this is not their first rodeo. And today's guest, Carrie Hoffman, it's not her first rodeo. Carrie is passionate about business transformation and getting as many companies as possible on their, on their journey to the next age. She's a best-selling author and CEO of Hoffman Digital, an ecosystem of companies igniting the human experience at work. She is going to explain a lot more of this and what she does. She's involved more than anything. So you understand um, Carrie's background a little bit. She spent 30 plus years in three corporations as an entrepreneur. And I love how she coins this. And Carrie, it's going to be one of my first questions. So be ready. I'm ready. This is Transformer. So welcome, Carrie. Thanks for joining me here today. Thanks, Ivy. I'm happy to be here. So, so um, you've worked... 30 years in different corporations and, and now you've launched your own. Okay. Yes. So, so you're a seasoned leader. Um, give us a little bit of the insight in your background in, in leading through unexpected times. What has that looked like for you? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I said I was an entrepreneur because yeah. I worked within corporations, but I loved um, taking an organization or a team earlier in my career and transforming them and doing it according to what do we need to do to drive business? What do we need to do to drive revenue? How can we get into markets deeper and faster? And how can we be innovative with some new solutions in order to do that? So I called myself an entrepreneur. Um, a lot of people were like, you should own your own company. And I was like, ah, nah, I'm an entrepreneur. <laughs> and so that's kind of where that word came from. So, um, it, you've you've lived and worked in various places leading other companies. What, give us a little bit. What has that looked like? Yeah, so I um, I'm from Wisconsin originally, and I started my career. I know that accent. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as I say I'm from Wisconsin, everyone's like, "Yeah, she really is," right? <laughs> It's the way we say that word. <laughs> but I started my career in a hospital as a medical technologist, but I joined a hospital where the lab, medical technologists work in a lab. The lab um, only did about 20% of the work from that hospital. And the other 80% of the work came from outside. So they ran the lab as a business. And this is probably where I first kind of, you know, just love the idea of, ooh, you're in a company or you're in a hospital, how do you run it like a business? And so we ran it like a business, we had a marketing department, we went to nursing homes and all these other places to get business and bring tests into the laboratory. And so we ran it like a business and had to have a profit. So we were always looking at how can we increase our profit? So early on, I got very involved in how can we improve our our processes. How can we, um, I actually did value stream mapping before it was called that. I actually mapped out <laughs> where we walked when we were doing lab tests and how could we reduce the amount of walking? How could we enter tests into the computer faster? We were very progressive. We had a hospital and a laboratory information system that was homegrown in the 1970s. Oh, wow. And so, yeah, we had lab instruments interface to the computer. And so it was almost That's impressive. like, it is, isn't it? So I was like, I loved it. I was always doing improvements. This was when hospitals and were all independent and they hadn't gone to integrated delivery networks yet. So I lived through that whole transformation. And this is where you have been on the forefront of innovation in business, the forefront of onset of when you talk about digital business and what that looks like in the digital, but you, you refer to digital business and I'm like, we're in the digital era. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, I was on the forefront of it because that was, that was in the eighties and nineties and we actually exited the industrial age and entered the next stage around the year 2000. And the trigger for this was an exponential growth in technology. Now, even though technology was the trigger, that's not the main thing about how businesses change. 
that's the trigger. So we're enabling, we're enabling business today with a lot of technology, but the way work is done is centered around a customer. And so this is where my career is really interesting because when I worked in that hospital, I became an expert troubleshooter on the lab analyzers. The lab analyzers are like the size of uh, a big table, right? And they're like a big giant box. And you put blood tubes in them and it goes around a conveyor belt and it spits out a result. It happens to be the same architecture, technically and mechanically, as a manufacturing line, which is very interesting, okay? But, but the point of this is, I was a customer of a very complex product. I then joined Johnson & Johnson in the division that sold lab analyzers and I entered in sales. So now I'm selling a complex product and then I moved into IT in that same business unit of Johnson & Johnson. And so I was a customer of a complex product, then I sold a complex product and then I supported it through IT. And so I have a very different view of IT and I always ran IT as a business. And so I spent 10 years in the hospital, 16 years at Johnson & Johnson and I ended up in business unit CIO roles and that's where I moved around. So I started in Wisconsin in sales, moved to New Jersey, went to Jacksonville, Florida, New Jersey, Singapore, New Jersey, okay? In 16 Singapore. years, <laughs> in 16 years, I moved every two or three years. So let's look at where you are and what you've seen during this time. So those are two questions. Let's break them down. So today, so you're, you're back in Wisconsin. Yes. Your home base. <laughs> People tend to do that when they're from Wisconsin. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's so not surprising. Um, my, and, and Carrie and I had this lovely conversation. My daughter also went to college at University of Wisconsin in Madison. So when we, right. when we started getting to know each other, we had so much to chat about. Um, so you're back in Wisconsin you've and you launched several years ago this business. Yes. Talk to me, share with me, myself and our listeners what you see, the business you launched, and then I wanted you to talk about, about this digital era or digital business today. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I originally, I actually, I said uh, Hoffman Digital is a collection of companies because I have two companies that I own. And then I partner with a lot of different companies, okay? So when I originally started um, about three years ago, um, I, I actually purchased a business coaching franchise from Focal Point. And so I'm a certified Focal Point business coach. And the reason that makes sense is throughout my whole career in corporate, corporate America, I was doing transformation. So I was taking a team or a company, I was transforming what they did, I was seeing how can we drive revenue and how can we reduce costs. So ultimately, how can we drive profit within a company? That's what I was doing. So it was very natural for me to exit and say, I wanna coach companies on how to do this. And my main client are technology companies. So this all comes together and it comes back around to this industrial age and digital age. So I work, my main client is technology companies that have very modernly architected technology that can really help big corporations to get into the next stage, okay? And then I started a second company called Get Digital Velocity where I work, I have a business partner and we actually work with large companies on their transformation. And it all goes back to the fact that we exited the industrial age around the year 2000 and we entered the next stage. And the way business was done in the industrial age, I just call it traditional business. So it's clear what we're talking about. And I call business in the next stage digital business. So people think of digital a lot of times as like digital marketing and sure that's a part of it, but this is a whole new way of doing business. And it is enabled by technology, but the most important thing is the customer and the way we treat the customer. So the customer in traditional way of doing things was always a focus, okay? But in today's world, you have to have extreme customer centricity. And that means you understand- I was just gonna say, <laughs> tell me more about that because we always know, you know, you train in sales, and, and I've, been, I've built a couple of businesses over my lifespan, 25 some odd years, right? And today, and I've always been, you know, the leader in sales in my companies, 
you know, and now I train in sales in this way. And it's, uh, the, you know, that adage of the customer is always right. Creating no like and trust with the with the with your potential sales people buy with from people they know like and trust. So the customer has always been that focus point. How right. are you? Where does it go to your next level? Yeah. So and and the customer has always been the focal point for sales, right? And it's always been the focus point for marketing, and it's always been the focal point for customer service. But extreme customer centricity means that you know your customer extremely well, and you know the issues that your customer is having. That might not sound new, but you know their issues even when it's not related to your current core products and services, okay? So you've got such a strong relationship that they're like, you've helped me with these, thing, these things. Have you guys ever thought about, this is your customer talking to you, have you ever thought about like doing a solution for this problem that I'm having? So okay. your customer ends up coming to you, right. asking you to solve more problems for them right? because they have the no like, and trust with not just you, but in the service and whatever you have delivered to them. Exactly. Exactly. And the other aspect of this is every person in your company, every single person has a touch point with a customer. Now, if you're a small business you may already do that and it's not that big of a deal, right? Well, of course all our employees have a touch point with a customer, but I'm even talking large corporations. So when I led IT teams, I required that my IT teams went on customer visits and it was very foreign for a lot of them, but twice a year they had to go on a customer visit and actually visit the customer with a sales or marketing representative so that they were learning how we were interacting with the customer. So it's extreme customer centricity for these reasons. And here's the other aspect of it. The other point of a new business or a digital business in this next age is that you're willing to solve your customer's issues even when it's not part of your core products and services. Now, in order to do that, that means that you are looking at modifying your products and services, that you're agile enough and you're quick enough to do so. And this is where that enablement by technology comes into play. So today, when you're working, um, you actually, I'm going to rephrase this, Carrie. Let's look at the lifespan that you have led. And there has been some unexpected times and there's been some navigating through. Absolutely. Um, when the onset of COVID-19 was a theory, was something's happening. And then all of a sudden in like three, two, one blast off, it, there was a complete, complete shift in business and going a hundred percent virtual digital unless you are mandatory employees. Yep. So it was, you know, when, when we, we've been through viruses, everybody said, okay, we're going to navigate X, Y, and Z when you're reading and you're staying attention to the news. But when it became the height that it, that it has, and everybody literally went to shelter in place, everything's going virtual. Um, what do you see? At, at, and again, this is not your first rodeo. So share a little bit of how you've navigated things in your company today and for your clients, as well as then I want to go into how you've navigated things in the past and how this ties together. Yeah. So navigating it um, today for my company itself um, it was pretty easy because we were set up as a digital company. Okay, so already set up to really pay attention to our customers at a deep level, understand their issues, and, and we're already helping them solve their issues. And that made, in order to do that, we had to be able to pivot and change and think innovatively, right? So, um, so very easy for us to do. Now, the interesting thing about COVID is, I said, we, we end, exited the industrial age in the year 2000, but companies, especially in the Western part of the world, so Asia's like way ahead on all this, by the way, um, in the Western part of the world, we were slowly moving out of the industrial age and, and changing our businesses. But when COVID-19 hit, 
it was like a huge push of all companies into the next stage because you had to work virtually, right? And you had to have technology enablement in order to do that. And then you had to rethink, if you weren't an essential business, um, there were two paths that were taken. And I, I call this a dichotomy of paths that happened with COVID-19. There were the people that kind of threw up their arms and went, I'm doomed. I'm, you know, the business is going to go bankrupt. And then there were the people that said, oh my God, all this is happening. I need to change. And they got innovative. Okay. And they started changing. Now there is an in-between path and that is the companies who were already digital just pivoted. Okay. It was very easy for them to pivot. So um, maybe, maybe it would help if I gave an example. Would it be I would, okay? I, excellent. Because I'm thinking, and I'm thinking actually down my client roster. And one of the things you said was companies that were doomed. And I call the, I refer to those as companies who went into the ostrich effect. I'm going to yes. put my head, bury my head down, put my head in the sand, wake me when it's over and we'll see what we can do. Right. Whether we salvage, whether we figure it out, whether we, right, we'll go back to business afterwards. And, you know, <laughs> ostrich is pretty animal, but it doesn't really work. Right. That's right. a business model. Uh, so then, you know, looking at the clients and the customers who said, hmm, what is showing up as needs right now? What is showing up as how do we serve our people right now? What do we do to show up? What problems are, are appearing as you're referencing? What problems are appearing? And how do we then pivot, shift, show up for those solutions? Yeah, exactly. So let me give a couple examples because I think it helps. So if you think about a company that totally pivoted, um, there's a there's some great examples out there, um, a big and small, but I'll, I'll I'll stick with small because then everyone can relate to it, right? So there are there was a home cleaning business, right, that goes into people's homes and cleans. That of course nobody wanted them in their homes, but they're good at cleaning, right? They actually changed their business into a delivery service and a high quality, safe delivery service because they understand how to keep things sanitized. And so they started doing home delivery, home delivery of food, home delivery of I'll go grocery shopping for you and bring your food, which there's a lot of highly compromised people that it really wasn't good for them to go into the grocery stores, right? And right. so they completely pivoted their business model. And we're talking like in a week, they did that. Another example are restaurants, and I'm, you know, and, and let me talk about a specific kind of restaurant, the dine-in only restaurant, okay, that never even did, maybe they didn't even do carry out because they were fine dining restaurants. There's an examples of restaurants, um, there was a, a restaurant owner, I think in New York City, who tweeted, threw his hands up and said, I just fired all my employees, we're doomed, we're going bankrupt, because we're dine-in only, so what are we going to do? And then there's, an, this comp, there's a restaurant that other side of the world, Washington, right? Seattle, Washington, very highly hit area as well. That's why yeah, I bring these two up. One of the first, first hit that they, and, and hit very hard. And hit very hard. That's why I bring up the New York restaurant and the Seattle yeah. restaurant. Mexican restaurant that was a high, high standard, like fine dining Mexican. And they, they didn't even do carry out they changed their hostess into a phone, take phone orders. They turned all their wait staff into package delivery and deliverers. So package up the food. Um, they were one of the first restaurants to have a menu of certain, like six different things only, right? And some of them were family packs of food and some of them were specific entrees, but they completely pivoted their business. And their business in March of 2020 was three times their business in March 2019. It's the same business model to start with. One it, it, closed. It's the same business model. <laughs> I'm going to tell you a small business story that is so true about this. And this is a friend, a friend from college. In college, he's, he was known for selling bandanas. Did you get it, bandanas listeners? What are you seeing some people walking around covering their face with? The bandanas. bandanas. Okay, this was his early, earliest stage and he you know, has done a variety of business evolutions over the years. 
onset of, of this pandemic, COVID-19, and he starts marketing bandanas and takes and gets somebody to sew the bandanas into face masks. Perfect. Was his best month ever, followed by April. <laughs> and it's not going to stop, right? Because yeah. this is not a one-time only event. You Let's know, talk about that. Let it, let it, let's talk about this because there's two really unique things about this event. One, it is the first time in the history of modern mankind that the entire world was impacted by something at the same time. I've heard people compare this to the Great Depression or to uh, war the world wars, but even those did not impact every single country in the world in every single country at the same time. So this is the first time we've had something that's been this big of an impact. The other thing is that, you know, it this it was predicted that there were going to be there was there were going to be pandemics like this just because of the nature of viruses and how they um, how they mutate and it's likely to happen again. So even when we have a vaccine for COVID-19, viruses mutate and so sometime there's going to be another one of these and it'll probably happen again. So the new normal, right, is, it really is the new normal. We keep hearing that, right? Because it's not gonna go back to the way it was, and it's gonna, we're gonna have to keep evolving and pivoting. Now, the whole nature of this next age and, and technology being the trigger, it was triggered by an exponential growth in technology. That means technology is just on, it's coming out on this exponential rate. It's coming out super fast and it's changing the way that we work because it's causing business to be sped up. And so companies that were born digital, meaning they started their company somewhere around the year 2000 or after, and they were using new modern technology, they were able to move a lot faster and they started speeding up business. And, and companies started slowly transforming because if they didn't speed up the way they did business, they couldn't keep up. If they didn't understand how to pivot their products and services to the solve customers' issues, then they weren't gonna stay relevant. And so this speed up of business is happening. And if you think about it, with COVID-19 happening, you had to pivot your business, right? And you had to pivot it quickly. So the more digital you are in the way you work, then the faster you're able to pivot your business, the faster you're able to innovate and change. And it's not, it's not slowing, it was speeding up all along. COVID just shoved us into the next age. It made everybody pivot at the same time where previously people were dragging their feet. It's, it's incredibly fascinating. Um, you know, here, and here's an example based on one of the things we did for Slater Success for my company is I moved upstate New York the evening of March 16th saying this is real. Mm-hmm. I was supposed to be doing a content episode setting up a series that was on women in finance that week, okay? And we do those content episodes with myself and one of my team members as a bandied about interviews so we get um, like very good conversation. I reach out to her early that morning. She's a mom working with two kids, right? Um, and I said, I wanna shift the interview. I want it, I want, to be released next Monday. This is probably Wednesday. We don't do this here at Our Success Story. We plan, <laughs> you know, edit, archive, the whole thing. I was like, we're releasing next Monday an interview on virtual teams. I and love how it. To run virtual teams effectively. She's like, okay. She's like, when do you want to do it? I say, can we do it this morning? <laughs> it's about 7 a.m. that we're going back and forth. And she goes, my kids are still in bed. How do you feel about now? <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, and you said, sure, yes, of course. Yes, because that's the idea of looking at leadership, looking at being um, leading in unexpected times is being aware of what's going on in the marketplace, being aware of what's going on in business, in the world, and then meeting it where it is and saying, yes, not maybe, not I'll think about it, stepping forward. 
Exactly. You know, I had a, a wonderful experience in Singapore um, where I was leading IT for the consumer division of Johnson & Johnson. And one of the things they said when I got out to Asia, this was 2008, 9, and 10, is so we carrying, had a recession in this country at 2008 and 2009. Let's reference the point of time and understand where it's coming from. Go ahead. You, you got it. That point of time is very important. When I got out there, they said, look, Carrie, anyone who comes out here from Europe or the U.S. or Latin America, they can't keep up with the pace because our pace is a lot faster. And I'm, I looked at them and I said, well, thank God, because I was so impatient in the US about how slow things were, because I'm a transformer, I'm an entrepreneur, I don't mind change, I like change, and people resist it, right? And it slows you down. People didn't resist change in Asia. They, they, there are these amazing pictures of like Shanghai in 2004 versus Shanghai in 2014. And it is unrecognizable because of the amount of buildings that have gone up. It's amazing. Just like go Google that and look at pictures. It's yeah, amazing. Ten-year span they, was hugely impactful. Unbelievable. And and we were still talking about um, emerging market companies, and we called them or countries. We called them BRIC: Brazil, Russia, India, China. And I get out to Asia, and I'm like, these comp these countries are not emerging. There are parts of China that were emerging. But the middle and upper class of China in 2008 was over 350 million people. That's bigger than the entire population of the U.S. Tier one cities, which are the most advanced, were way ahead of any cities in the West. Um, and so we get, we're, we get hit with this downturn where when I got there, we, were, we had been growing. Uh, I had teams in 14 countries. J&J does business in over 20 countries in Asia. They were growing between 10 and 20 percent. And then within a year, they were only growing zero to 10%, okay? But they were growing, right? Because they knew how to pivot, because they knew how to move fast. And so we were coming up with all these innovative solutions um, to drive market share within my IT team. So in India, distributors are very small. The people go out on motorcycles and deliver the products. The same J&J, &J, Baby Shampoo, Band-Aids, all those products, Neutrogena, Avino, they deliver them in little scooters with things on the back. Their distribution center is like a walk-in closet, and they're, uh, they're, uh, or like a one-car garage, and their office is like a walk-in um, closet, okay? We had 90 of these um, distributors within India at the time. And my team came up and created a distributor ERP system on a very simple um, technology. They rebuilt used computers and gave them to the distributors. And we, in four months, went from 90 to 450 distributors. Wow. We increased market share, okay? We increased revenue. At the same time, in Malaysia, we did one-to-one -one marketing, business-to-consumer marketing on mobile phones before smartphones. A lot of people don't know this, but before smartphones, before the iPhone, the phones in Asia did about 10 things, whereas the phones in the West only did text, call, and email if you had a BlackBerry. They had semi-smartphones before smartphones even existed. They were doing banking in Philippines and India. Yes. They were doing one-to-one -one marketing to consumers, sending them text messages about um, consumer packaged goods. We increased revenue through this one-to-one -one market programming in Malaysia. It was so entrepreneurial. It, it was just this great experience, right? So real, as we close, for the leaders of today and the leaders of tomorrow, when we're hit with an unexpected time, and it's not gonna be the first and it's not gonna be the last, what is the one thing to be aware of? The one thing, or the one, the one simplest tip you could take? I think the one simplest tip that I can take people relates to business and relates to you personally. And that is the biggest time of growth that you can have is during the biggest challenges. If you're willing to see the obstacles that are before you as an opportunity to do something different. I love it. I love it. Carrie, thank you so much for joining me here today. 
Um, you want to uh, check out, Carrie, how could our listeners learn more about you, your process, and follow you? How the easiest way to, is to go to carriehoffman.com and you can see my collection of businesses there. There's also, by the way, a, um, a three-part video series. They're, they're 12 minutes or less. That'll teach you about this move out of the industrial age and into the next stage. So listeners, if you want to really, really get more of a comprehensive insight to what Carrie is referencing, which I think is brilliant and I know to be fact, of the onset and us now living in the digital age, the digital era, and how you can really lead to the best of your ability, you wanna check that out. Carrie, thank you so much for joining me here today on Her Success Story. Thanks for having me, Ivy. And listeners, remember to hit subscribe below. We come into your inbox every Monday with another piece of either great content or a fabulous interview like today's. Feel free to leave a comment. What your biggest takeaway is? What is the impact of today of listening to today's interview with Carrie? What actions are you going to be taking? We do this to serve you and to help all leaders grow to the best of their ability. Thanks for joining us here today.